you can hear from the startups that are making change and they're cutting the edge of the future. So I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and then uh, we'll have a fruitful discussion about customer engagement and distribution. So starting at the end, uh, Phil um, is from Slice and Phil is from Canada. So we have a couple Canadians and actually like an almost Canadian on the panel. So one of the great things that you'll kind of notice about our group is that we want to bring to you the, the best panelists that we can. So to the extent that we can bring them in from New York, we absolutely will. But to the extent where people are making change all over the country and all over the world, we will do that as well. So Phil is a 25 year veteran in insurance. Um, he's led marketing initiatives at EIS and EDS. And this is just one of his stops that's below 26,000 feet. So thanks for coming, Phil. Thank you, thanks for having us. Yeah, so uh, next in line is Mariah. And um, Mariah has been through the entire cycle of insurance. So she's been on the kind of distribution in the retail side, she's been at AIG, and now she's in kind of the um, part of the business that not a lot of people know about, which is the excess and surplus side of the business. And she actually has one more year on Phil, so um, you would never guess, right? And but the great <laughs> the great advantage of that is that as you're thinking of questions, any part of the distribution is is fair game for Mariah. So think of some tough ones, and then um, thank you. Last, <laughs> last, but certainly not least is Jane Wang. Jane and I were actually together last week at the Global Insurance Accelerator in Des Moines. Not quite as fun as New York, but there's a lot of interesting things that are in farm towns that uh, you learn. So what, what um, Jane's background is, is actually some of the things, and if you saw her taking pictures as Zach was talking about, pushing the edge of that envelope. And um, what she does with Optimity is um, she partners with different insurance companies to introduce corporate wellness programs. And so far they've already had eight and hopefully for the insurers that are here, you'll think about some of the benefits of her programs. And I actually just got on her app yesterday in a secret private group. So I'm gonna learn about how to get healthy and hopefully uh, help my health insurer um, have me as a better customer. So we're gonna have uh, a fruitful discussion, but to kick things off, I wanted to start with a, a simple question. So for everyone here, you come in different lines of business, right? And actually, why don't we start with a little poll. How many of you guys here are from InsurTechs? Just raise your hand or a little wiggle. So pretty good proportion. How about from carriers or brokers? And then how many here are on the life and health side? Good. And then property and casualty. So for those of you that don't have eyes in the back of your head, um, it's kind of split on both sides. So that was kind of more for my panelists here uh, than you guys, but you know as well. So what I want to start out with is because we have the audience on both sides is what does customer engagement mean to you? Because customer engagement has a lot of interpretations and it means different things for different lines of business. So Two sentences, each of you. Since we both work on the life insurance side and the health insurance side more so in Canada, customer engagement for our life insurance side means more persistent policyholders, healthier policyholders, less claims, and also referrals from those policyholders. So it's a lead gen mechanism for them as well. Um, so I'll tell you um, what it's not. It is not simply relationship management. So to me, customer engagement means when you think about designing your customer excellence process, you put yourself in the seat of the customer. You make it a needs-based approach. They are not there to buy your product. And frankly, that is one perspective I would extend to you. I see a lot of insure tech startups with some really interesting technology that approach prospects under the guise that they're in business to buy your product. You have to be able to put yourselves in the shoes of the customer first if you're to be a part of their customer experience journey and customer excellence as a value partner. 
I don't know what I can really say after the lawyers have come up and said all of the things that we should be concerned about, but that's, that's tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, we are innovating and uh, it, it's really good to get the, the check and the balance against uh, really what the law uh, permits and doesn't and also to see the work that's being done to extend it. Uh, customer engagement, um, you know, in, in, in our world and, and I think what's important is we live in a digital age, right? So every, every part of our lives has been digitized. So I'll say two things, it's the, um, the digital exchange of value, okay? So there has to be value from both parties and in the context of all of what the collective here is trying to do to the insurance industry, that's why I say digital. And then the second sentence I would say for insurers is really the need to be relevant uh, without necessarily being present. And then I'll elaborate on that uh, later. So you want to have the digital exchange of value. You want to be relevant for the customer. Talk about customer engagement, but you really need to be present in that transaction. And there are many ways in which you might not be present, but you definitely will be relevant. Thanks, Phil. So while I was at the Global Insurance Accelerator Week, I had a number of discussions with InsureTechs, and one of the big things that stuck in my mind is, is kind of two facts. One is that for the average life insurance seller or agent, they only reach out to, on a yearly basis, 10 to 20% of their book. And that means that the other 80 or 90% doesn't really have a conversation or a touch point or some level of engagement. And given that Jane affects that side of things, and then on the other side of things, Phil is working with a new type of people. He's working with gig economy workers that don't really want to have to think about insurance. So my question for you guys is, given that a number of the people in the audience are from traditional carriers, what are the challenges traditional carriers have now and then as you continue to introduce your new ideas into the world, what challenges will they have to stay relevant? Um, I think they, so one of the challenges that we have as an industry is, is really we've, we've done what we have done for you know, well over 100 years the same way. And then the world around us now has changed. So the gig economy is one example of that where um, you know, someone taps a button and they go from just being an individual to being a part-time business, having someone stay in their home for a fee, which, which you know, now you're a business, so you can get sued as a business. Um, I'll then I'll leave that to the lawyers. Uh, but, you know, so the, the, the world has changed and, you know, the policy, you know, we were used to an annual policy, in some cases, let's say a six-month policy, and now we're doing everything in short stints. Um, so the challenge is really how do we adapt? So how do we adapt products that fit what that new person or that in our case the gig economy worker or the SME owner is doing um, and leaving aside all of the conventions that we've had around for a hundred years or you know well over a hundred years. So in our case, uh, you know, we decide okay, we and we grew up in the industry so we didn't come at this, you know, ignorant in a way that, you know, just fresh and not knowing insurance. And it was really, let, let's put everything aside. Do you really need an application form if you can get all of the data? Do you really need um, you, you know, an annual policy? Uh, do you really need to separate personal and commercial lines? And then we've, frankly, we've challenged uh, and have gone to market, uh, you know, breaking down those conventions. So I think the number one challenge is really, how do you leave behind how you've been doing things for so long? Because so much is changing at once. You know, the, how people engage is changing. How they work is changing, how they live is engaging, is changing, how they use their house, how we use our cars, uh, everything that is affecting the core definition of risk is changing. So you have to put aside, and if you don't do that, the challenge is not putting aside those conventions to think about the future. That's awesome. Um, and I think the question was that in the life space, uh, when you have agents, they don't get to reach out to all the customers for even their annual reviews. And um, I think, yeah, 10, 20%, that could be the extreme, but uh, when we're working with the carriers, uh, we, we hear about 60% type of uh, 
uh, review rates for the current customers. And I like what you said, which is really about giving value. So uh, yeah, in life insurance, the touch points are so few that there's really a, not that much value being communicated back to the consumer. And as there's a lot of digital other solutions, what happens, um, uh, just yesterday I gave a talk about wellness will either keep or steal your policyholders, because if you're healthy, you can get different promotions from other uh, carriers that could be better, maybe less price, maybe more coverage, maybe more value added services, which is why it's so important to engage with your customer at that level. And um, we work with two types of carriers, so the type that has their captive agent force, and in there, the, uh, the issue that we see mostly with customer engagement is actually mostly an operational one. So it's the actual agents being able to uh, get onto a CRM, so some of them are actually going onto Salesforce for the first time and like doing that, um, but uh, managing that, uh, that pool of people and uh, systematically booking these appointments with them and talking to them, and also finding the new leads and the people that are high quality for them to talk to. So uh, having a system uh, like ours actually help them in sifting through those people by staying engaged with those, uh, because as an average consumer, Every day we get hungry, right? Every day we are tired or sleepy. These are health and wellness type of problems, and that's why on your phone it's more likely to that you interact with something that's kind of health and lifestyle related versus something like a financial product, which you're not likely to interact with on a daily basis. It may be, you know, think of a tax filing software or something, or even a will service. It, takes a while uh, for you to go back and use it again. So that's why it's super important to change the cadence of customer engagement with a more of a lifestyle type of product. Uh, the other side, uh, besides the captive agent, we also uh, work with carriers that just work with their independent agent, and I think that comes with other problems where um, the independent agent is not necessarily tied to a particular carrier, so there's right there's different ways that they place it. How how would I choose versus something from John Hancock that has a vitality program to, for example, work with Emeritus with Emeritus with an optimity program? It's you know it's easier to choose that type of program over something that doesn't come with anything with of value or anything that comes with rewards. You can get stuff back. So that's interesting. And then um, I think with them on the distribution side and agent and engagement, it's agent churn. So uh, there's a lot of orphaned policies out there where uh, you know someone, they bought a policy with a broker, but that person no longer works there because the average age of a broker, it may be surprising to some insure tax is 62. So all these people are retiring in three years, so there's gonna be a lot of orphans out there. So how are you gonna deal with all these policyholders that don't have a direct connection or to, to a carrier? It's just, uh, that's why it makes it uh, like an issue for them. So I just wanted to follow up one question for you, Jane, given the reality of the age of life insurance agents. Do you believe that as we move forward into the future, that there's going to be more reliance on a third party like an organization like yourself? Or do you think that there's going to be a transition where the life insurance agents are selling off their books to younger people? And how does that become a challenge as you have people inheriting books that they didn't sell the business to? Yeah, and that's a reality of the challenges. Uh, I think it's going to be a hybrid. Uh, I, I got asked a really hard question, um, I think a few months back, where I was on a different panel, where it's like, do you think uh, what about direct-to-consumer, right? Are you going to take all the different connections and go direct-to-consumer? Are there going to be no agents going in the future? I think that's absolutely not going to happen because there's going to be different types of people and when I make a major financial decision, I'd like to go talk to my financial advisor. And buying life insurance, especially of a certain amount, is going to require me just even for the comfort factor to talk to a human. So I think you know it's going to be some sort of logistical issue to help people get comfortable. Um, on the other side, what the question that you asked is really interesting because it's also talking about abandonment, right? Like all these people that own relationships and own books. And I think we're in a world where the connections are becoming a lot more local. So what I see um, in terms of marketing dollars, in the past, right, I can take a megaphone and I can shout on a uh, Super Bowl ad or I could shout over some TV ads and I want to reach a consistent 
base of people. But now all of you don't watch TV anymore, really. You're on Netflix, right? You get to choose the things that you watch. There's no ads. So what happens with that is that people's connections to content is going to be more yourself, and then you're going to end up with when we're looking at the social graph, so even when you look at LinkedIn social graph and how people are connected, there's a lot more small clusters. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sheffy gave a really interesting talk from Coverager talking about part-time agents, part-time insurance brokers, that type of stuff. I think there's some, there, there's definitely some research that uh, that support local connections because uh, in the end, the people that influence my major financial decisions, they already know me or they come personally recommended from a friend of mine that had just purchased that. So I do think it's really important to get to the personalized level and to get to a level where uh, it's you know one degree of separation away from that person who's making that purchase. Thanks, Jane. So the next question is for Mariah, and I think she has a much more challenging role given that she's both in the middle, being in the wholesale lines, and she also deals with commercial, which is more of a multifaceted type of relationship. So how do you feel um, the brokers that work in the small commercial space, which is often the least innovation and the most expensive to develop a relationship with a client, what do you think that their biggest barriers are to creating more engagement? So um, I'll take that um, on two levels. So first of all, I don't think there are any barriers to engagement at all in terms of the environment that we operate in today. I like to think about it in terms of how you can engage effectively with your customers and with your prospects in really what is a multi-dimensional value chain in terms of the way we distribute property casualty products, at least in the United States today. So on one level, let me maybe talk about the sales cycle and how data and analytics and certainly some newer technologies have absolutely enabled the prospecting and sales cycle. So no longer do you have to go the old-fashioned route, which is look up a name, understand the SIC code of a customer, go knock on that door, be it a broker or an actual prospective insured. Hi, what do you do? How big is your business? What are your business needs today? Many of the brokers, particularly the retail brokers that I work with at all risks and that I'm responsible for managing for, have been developing not only you know, enhanced needs, you mentioned Salesforce, so Salesforce is probably the most prevalent CRM platform. We've got lots of brokers that have developed their own versions of that. Marsh calls it Marsh Force. Acrisure has their own version of it that they call Acrovision. For those of you that are familiar with Risk Match, that's a uh, CRM platform that has made some significant inroads in an independent and private equity backed retailer space. But they've completely enabled through data and analytics a view in terms of how you prospect and how you sell. Even to the point where if you have a property casualty client that purchases directors and officers insurance from you, these platforms can help predict the next two lines of insurance that that client is most likely to purchase from you in the sales cycle. So I think, you know, on one hand, effective engagement with customers, really a, a lot of strides and a lot of moves a lot of moves forward in terms of technology enabling the prospecting and sales cycle. On the other side of it, and this is probably one that is affecting my business as a wholesale broker a little bit more in terms of, you know, real time. Um, and that is ability to access data and information about risks very quickly, accurately and quickly. And that is something, frankly, that can enable the submission process in a big way. So, you know, the insurance industry is still pretty antiquated in terms of the way we take risks to market, right? You have a retail broker who puts together a set of accord apps, fills out all these little fields with all this information that is almost all publicly available information today. And you're literally like pushing emails and pieces of paper to wholesale brokers like me and to carriers like AIG. So, that is another part of effective customer engagement that has been enabled by data and analytics, by platforms, where again, you can scrape publicly available information, you can come up with a much more accurate profile in terms of what the client or prospect looks like, and then again, in a very real-time environment, you can share the opportunity to support that client with a multitude of carriers and specialty wholesale brokers like myself. So, so for me, I don't see any barriers to it. Like you can go knock on anybody's door that you want to, right? But you need to be able to do it in an informed and efficient way that once you can actually get your foot in the door, 
got to be able to make money on that transaction and delight your customer as well. Okay, exactly what you're saying, right? So we, uh, in the U.S. here, we, through a partnership with AXA, we sell a small business cyber. Uh, small business cyber, you know, uh, faced that same thing. Us as a small business, it took us, you know, 90 days or whatever it was to get a cyber policy. And then the next day, our CTO spun up, uh, you know, on AWS, 30 new endpoints, which, you know, our policy has no clue about. Uh, but we built a product that was able to use uh, data sources, like you're mentioning, uh, take away 98% of the friction uh, so that it can be uh, purchased digitally. And then the customer engagement when it comes to value is really then about what value do I give back to that small business owner? And then there's a live dashboard that assesses them as a small business, you know, what the risks are. And that's how you create engagement. And that's an example of how we delivered value back to them. Just like in health and wellness, you know, we're now all obsessed with our daily steps and our calories and so forth. Well, that small business owner is becoming more and more aware of what cyber risks uh, may do, especially to small business. I think like numbers like 90% of small businesses that will face a certain data breach, uh, you know, might not recover from it. The average costs are about 170K. Um, you know, you, you take that away by, and, and you know, they care, right? It, it's their business. So I think the customer engagement team and then the data, and that, that's the key that, you know, for the next generation is about replacing that, and that's what I was referring to, replacing the old way that we've done things as a result of it. You know, we don't need to ask any questions. We have, and our partner is satisfied, our underwriting partner is satisfied that, hey, that data is there. Why ask the question if I can get the data? Now, you need to make sure that, you know, you can rate and you can underwrite based on that data. And you know, we're still in a very much evolving world, but that's a real life example of, you know, putting those two practices into play uh, today, right here in, in the US. Yeah, so I think now that we've got a chance to hear about some of the barriers, especially the traditional processes, the accord forms and the lack of access to data, I think Let's, let's now focus on some of the solutions and some of the values of using those solutions to improving engagement. And, and one of the discussions that Phil and I had recently was that there's already things that are out there in the world, in this digital ecosystem, that are giving us information. So I think, Phil, what would be great for you to share with audiences what are some of those tools that insurers can use within the broader digital ecosystem? And if it's not available, how do you go about establishing a connection to the digital ecosystem to underwrite new products? Yeah, so digital ecosystems, I think, is a, a very big theme these days. So McKinsey uh, predicts that, you know, by 2025, 30% of all transactions are essentially going to go through ecosystems. And as we know, I mean, everything is being done digitally. Uh, for insurance, if you just extrapolate that, that's you know a trillion dollar opportunity uh, of DWP that could go, you know, is is going to transfer and run through uh, ecosystem. So, you know, what what does that mean? And one of the things that we've learned is if you look at and you know ourselves, we look at a mobility ecosystem, and we've got you know a few products in that world today, a rideshare product, etc. What you see that has happened is so mobility, home, small business, and um, and travel and leisure for that are relevant to us as a business. Um, what you see is is these ecosystems, these players in there uh, are really trusted brands, right? So the people that drive for Uber, the people that use you know uh, Google, that use Facebook, they use Apple and do everything on Apple. I mean, they basically they've you know delegated their lives and there's brand loyalty and there's trust and when we look at insurance you know for a, a big part you know as an industry we don't have that right so we don't have loyalty we don't have trust so the, the one of the big things that we see is insurance you know take your products where the customers are so we've spent billions and billions of dollars trying to bring customers to us uh you know geico spends two billion in tv ads every year uh, you know, and, and etc. Now let's go where the customers are, and they're engaging digitally in these ecosystems. So I think that's another aspect that changes. So that my comment earlier about being present, uh, you don't have to be present to be relevant. Is if you can, um, you know, essentially make make your insurance product available inside the digital ecosystem, 
without any friction, then there's a tremendous opportunity of the person just saying, I'm getting this thing from Uber, Airbnb, you know, whoever, whatever the ecosystem might be. And I love that brand and I trust what I'm getting from that brand. And now you're seeing insurance as a product, as a service, aware of everything that you talked about earlier in terms of tie-in and, and, and so forth. Of course, regulation plays a big role. But I think that's, that's the huge opportunity is really the customers are there. That's where they engage. Let's take the products there and we have a mindset of how do we bring the customers to us. And I think that's the shift and that's the biggest opportunity. So when we work with carriers, they tell us, help us get there. We're not set up to, you know, have a micro product, you know, be part of a digital, a small digital transaction that an SME is going to have um, today, right? And that, that's going to be different tomorrow. How, how do you adjust your offering in real time? If there's a contractor dealing on a gig platform and, you know, one day he's doing electrical work, the next day he's doing carpentry work, the next day he's doing something that needs a, a separate cert, uh, you know, they just want to be able to go to their app and say, here's my cert, and my cert is good for three days. And because the job is tied to a calendar, when the job is done, the cert, you know, is no longer required. That's the type of engagement that we're seeing. That's the type of engagement that we're enabling. Uh, and, and I think that's, the, that's really the opportunity with ecosystems is really take your products there. Sure. So... Um, given that a lot of the carriers are not necessarily set up to be interoperable with a digital ecosystem, and I know you guys have tools for that, Phil, I'm kind of curious from Jane's perspective, given that some of the carriers that you're working with, it's kind of first time for them to really have an expansive program within InsureTech, what are some of the things that you do to make it easy for them, and what are some of the things that you handle for them so they don't have to worry about it? Yeah, uh, well, the first thing you can say to them to make them happy is no integration needed. Uh, so that's the first phase. And that's something we learned before because uh, it takes a long time. It's a full colonoscopy every time we go through a security review. Uh, but we still go through that, but I think it really makes it uh, easier for a carrier when you tell them that they don't have to have... Oh, can you still hear me? Okay, oh, great, you're back. So it, can, you, it doesn't have to go into the IT budget. It doesn't have to go find IT people to do any of this integration. So that's really helpful. And then the second set, uh, eventually there will be an integration. So when we integrate with uh, CRMs and things like that, it does do that. And then the second thing is, uh, I'll take a poll here. How many of you out there have talked to your customer, so someone that you sell to, uh, if um, in the last month? about how you else, yeah, how can you improve that? Okay, keep your hand up if you're an insurance carrier. Okay, where are you from? Okay, excellent, yeah. Um, I think uh, a lot of times when we ask the, and who's, like, are, are you, do you view the agent as your customer or do you view the, okay, the agent as your Yes, okay, excellent. So that actually makes a really, really good point here is because uh, most carriers that we currently work with, I would say all eight examples, are not that used to talking to the consumer. Um, they, they, they're just not part of the process. Uh, there's full teams for product. There's full teams for even regulatory, all, all kinds of different really interesting uh, and intricate actuarial parts uh, and some of my favorite people. But uh, when you look at the processes of the machine on, in general, they are not used to talking to the end consumer who is actually consuming the product, especially for something like life insurance, health insurance. It's kind of interesting. So what we can do for them is take on that role. So that's what we do that's in our uh, DNA. And I think most of you that did raise, put your hand up, that's insure techs out there. And I think that's amazing because uh, what you can bring to the carrier is the fact that uh, that rapid cycle, that live conversation with the people that are consuming the products. And then on the agent side too, it's so wonderful that you guys are doing that. We're doing the same thing with our agent modules, uh, which is talking to the agents about what can improve their uh, cycles. So these are the things that I learned about these all these custom CRMs, all these workaround uh, solutions, uh, what they're actually doing, what's the actual percentage of time that they're spending uh, doing cold calls, uh, which was a slight surprise to me. Uh, so all these things help us uh, 
understand their work context and be able to design solutions for them. And I think to your point earlier, customer engagement is a radical shift. Um, it's a it's a practice of radical customer centricity. Right? So instead of how can I blanket, make it really easy for me to put an ad so that there's as many people as possible on it, um, you're saying Geico is spending two points on the PNC side, State Farm, $5.6 billion last year spent on marketing. Uh, what if you take that $5.6 billion and spent that on people? spent that back on you, right? Spent that back on the policyholder. Spend it in their life and health in, in in right? Like that's a lot of value that could be added. Five point six billion dollars invested into life and health, you're curing something, right? You're definitely helping people in their quality of life. So it's a really the practice of radical customer centricity and we help them by talking to the customer first. So no integration, making it operational easier. And on the other side, bringing in a new set of that rapid cycle and making it easy for them. So we do take on a lot of the marketing and the actual qualitative research and the user research and creating products from there. So it's kind of, yeah, we're like a, a side engine that produces things and then we package it up for them in a clear like project plan. So I think that's also a really helpful part about working with insurance companies. They like structured things, so it's really good. Buy Microsoft's project, all of you who are in insure tech. Yeah. Make sure you have a plan when you go in there to implement your projects. Yeah, so thanks Jane for sharing about your process for working with the carriers and engaging. And I think um, to shift a little bit to the other side of the equation, where is distribution going now that we kind of have some of the tools, I wanted to shift the next question to Mariah to tell us about your vision of how you see the buying process or the future of distribution 10 years from now. So um, there is, um, there is one trend that everybody that's in the insurance industry in the U.S. needs to be really clear on, and that's we're seeing an unprecedented amount of M&A activity. And every quarter they keep predicting, well, there's, no, there's definitely not going to be as many mergers and acquisitions as was done in the quarter before or a year prior, but yet on a year-to-day basis, we've seen over 800 M&A transactions, principally in the retail um, agent and broker space, but if you guys like me, are like me and you listen to the rumor mill as well, you know, I fielded several calls this morning about that, you know, Ann is still trying to buy Willis Towers Watson, so that could be like a, you know, a, a mega acquisition in the industry. Um, but if you think about that unprecedented amount of M&A activity and the way that is going to change the landscape of who the brokers are, who the players are, that's one real significant shift that if you're a purchaser and I'll confine it right now to property casualty or commercial insurance, you're going to have different options available to you in another three, five, and definitely in 10 years in terms of who's a player. So that is, is one significant shift. The second significant shift that I see every day in our business is this move from being a generalist in the property casualty space to a specialist. So instead of facing off in the marketplace and trying to sell because I'm a property specialist, most uh, evolving retailers and wholesalers are thinking about the way they position themselves as a real estate or a technology or a manufacturing specialist. And so that move from being a generalist that sells multiple lines of insurance to someone that specializes in an industry but can craft a multi-line industry-centric solution is also an important way that you see the distribution model continuing to evolve and change. And then, you know, last but not least, and I already touched on this, again, it's the role of data and analytics and the ability for really talented brokers to partner with clients and insureds to improve their risk profile. So your example earlier about purchasers of cyber, right? Almost every major account or Fortune 1000 company is a purchaser of cyber insurance today. It's the middle market segment and the SME heavy emphasis on the S that today are still not purchasers of cyber insurance. It's less about onboarding clients to buy products and more about working closely with clients in terms of improvement of their risk profile. And I think that will dramatically shift and change the insurance purchasing cycle in the next decade. Thanks. So 
We have time for roughly one more question coming from uh, the audience, but I, I want to encourage all of you to ask questions. So we set up a program because it was one of our requests last time to have everyone participate. So um, on the screen you can see menti.com. If you go there and enter the code 134126, um, we'll have an opportunity for you guys to ask a couple questions. But in the meantime, while you're going through that process, I'm going to ask um, our panelists a question to give you a moment to come up with your questions. So, given that we're in this cosmopolitan place called New York, I don't think this discussion couldn't be complete without international perspectives. So we'll go um, across the panel starting with Phil, um, and you can choose. Uh, do you believe that engagement is happening more effectively in Europe or here? That's choice one. Or choice two is do you think in Asia or here engagement is more effective and um, forward thinking. So you could pick Europe or Asia and then answer. Great, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll pick Asia. Um, there's an interesting shift uh, that is happening in Asia which is uh, really around, uh, the, around digital and around super apps. Uh, so basically super apps like Grab as an example that are ecosystems in themselves so they offer payment solutions, they offer banking, they offer insurance, and of course there's Grab, which is you get a car, you get food, so it's basically you know a, an Uber, Uber, uh, in a sense. Uh, the, the interesting shift there and what's happening in, in Asia, and I'll say it's more advanced or more ripe, is because, first of all, insurance penetration rates are a lot lower, right? so we're they're, they're nowhere near as insured as we are here or in Germany or Switzerland, as an example. Uh, micro, digital micro products are ripe for this, so it's the ripe market where I'm doing everything on a digital channel on on my phone, um, and you know I'm underinsured. So awareness has to come first. So awareness of risk, awareness of need, um, and then you know that that market is really ripe for the two things that we've talked about here: ecosystems and digital customer engagement. So. We as a company are, are quite excited about what is happening over there. And you know, it will, this is one of those things that I think it will trickle here. Normally things go from here abroad. Uh, I think this is one of the trends, especially with immigration patterns or what, what have you, that we're gonna see you know, come our way. So that, that's, that's the one I'll choose. Um, so first of all, I'm glad you didn't make it a choice of, of Canada versus US, David, so thank <laughs> you for that. Um, so um, my professional experience is mostly U.S. centric, but I have had an opportunity uh, to work with Europe. So one thing about the U.S. from a commercial insurance perspective, it, it is the most sophisticated and mature insurance marketplace in, in the world. It is also the only marketplace where we have an excess and surplus lines or non-admitted marketplace. So that adds, adds a dynamic element to the U.S. marketplace. So I would say in terms of sophistication of product, um, I would select the U.S. I would also point out that the U.S. is typically viewed by much by many global insurance carriers like this is the marketplace that either makes or breaks their balance sheet. So it is absolutely the venue where they need to be successful in. However, I will point out to you that Europe, in my mind, since we're talking about customer experience, is really heads and tails above the U.S. in terms of adoption of net promoter score very early on in terms of taking very real-time customer feedback and integrating that into both product and service-oriented processes. So um, different props for different reasons to different regions. Yeah, and I'll add another, I guess, slice or dimension to, to the selection. I think uh, because I work with health data, uh, there's a lot of regulation and there's um, a different types of uh, I would say checks and balances, but also uh, costs that's associated with certain checks and balances. So for example, in Europe, there's a lot of GDPR stuff. Uh, we started in Canada, so it was kind of interesting because it required us to also have a similar uh, data standard to both Europe and also uh, to the US, so that kind of helped in a lot of way for global expansion. And then the other thing is because English and French it required multilingual, 
so that also uh, helped in multi uh, the expansion part. Um, I do see a lot of energy in, in Asia, and I think the reason that there's a lot more energy in Asia is because speed of adoption of the carriers, and also l less regulation, so it's less costly for the uh, some of the insure techs to get somewhere, uh, so both in terms of paid revenue, but also into getting into a platform that is commercializable uh, without having, so for example, we had to go through full HIPAA compliance, we have to go through audits, we have to go through all of these things that was required in the North American space. But if you're a North American startup, you're absolutely right, um, for you to expand into the other places, it's really primed because uh, I'm based in San Francisco and I can tell you the number of uh, a, like Japanese uh, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, um, people from Europe coming to Silicon Valley specifically looking for uh, solutions to bring back to their regions.